Hello, guys, and welcome back for another interesting evening. Tonight we have me joined by Savonix. We're going to be casting the Slow Mods versus Interstellar Aquila. Aquila? 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 Yeah. So, um, what do you think of uh, tonight's matchup, Savonix? Oh, Any hot takes? Super hyped for this matchup. Interstellar Aquila. Uh, last time round, they came up against, uh, I believe it was Beast Team Esports, uh, and it was a 1-1 result in that series. Um, I think we had uh, Signs of Life, especially from Zadorzo and Marcus in the top lane. Uh, so basically the two solo laners, they played really well. But in game two, it just uh, it, they were kind of shaky, and um, Beast Team Esports were able to pie up the series. So I think Interstellar, still a strong roster coming in. I personally don't know too much about slow mods, and I was hoping that maybe you could uh, quickly break down uh, who the Interstellar opponents are today. Yeah, um, a team that's, to at least my knowledge, and not some, someone I know a lot about, but they're kind of due to Disney with some uh, memorable names playing in other tournaments, such as Red Gaming as well. Uh, so definitely knows of the competitive scene and their team that's, uh, you know, very balanced, I think. And like when you look at both teams, they're very balanced. Uh, especially when you look, compare like the rankings of the teams, uh, similar scores. They have very similar level of solo queue players, at least. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting, yeah, well, the game series uh, on our hands here. Yeah, very, very interesting indeed. And uh, as you said, it's really important to touch on the individual abilities of both teams, as they are very close with each other. I've got the their op.ggs right in front of me, and. Uh, there's probably, um, I mean, you could probably average their, their ELOs out to be similar, if not like maybe 10, 15 LP apart from each other. So two very evenly matched squads. And um, I mean, personally for me, I think I've got my eyes on the solo lanes here because as we saw uh, in the last game, you know, as I mentioned, Interstellar, so in game one, the solo lanes over Interstellar Aquila, they, they played their lanes well and they're able to win the game. The second time around, this, it was a similar story. If the solo lanes faltered, and then they lost. And it just seems like Interstellar are a team that not live and die, but they rely a lot on the performance of their solo lanes, whether or not they win or lose the game. Yeah, definitely. And that's always a scary thing, where if you're really relying on this, and you don't have any, you know, may, or maybe you don't have any, but you have a very low to uh, little, um, well, team cooperation, and you're very reliant on these laners getting ahead. Then once you don't do that, or once you face strong laners, you're going to struggle hard as a team. So really excited to see if they can get over this bump or not. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's very, very, um, I mean, commonly, actually, in the SLE, we've seen a lot of games where the solo lanes are super important, which is very different to the rest of the meta because it's a bot lane centric uh, meta right now but uh, obviously there is some power in top lane but uh, the meta itself has very little power in mid and uh, we see a, a kaisa first pick already yeah i mean something maybe recently hasn't been as much first picked as it was a few patches ago but still a very strong champion that has multiple angles and with the new um build that's been you know showing up a, a little here and there with the um i don't know if you've seen it the lethality build where you go Qmax first with the mm, yeah 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 but so maybe it's getting some more popularity again and uh, the Svein answer here or at least the hover is weird to me could be like something like Svein Senna kind of thing going on here like trying to negate getting double range into the Kaiser just outranging her and having a strong lane but otherwise it's interesting flames pick not something we see often not something we see often and I, I think you know it, it can be a decent flex pick but it, it has dropped off and there are much better flex picks available in the meta right now um i mean firstly uh, one thing i've noticed is another ash ban and in the sle i for some reason i see ash getting banned all over the place and uh, we see the mf picked here do you think ash is a champion that teams are overrating a little bit i mean it's really hard to say ash is overrated uh due to her just having so much utility in her kit. So I think it's a very fair ban. Uh, has a lot of good lanes, so it doesn't have a lot of high counters. And yeah, just a strong overall champion. I can see why it's banned. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely a good champion, but um, I mean, nonetheless, it's not a champion we seem to be seeing too often due to the priority in bans that it has. As uh, we're entering a the ban phase and we see Wukong Thresh has been locked in for Interstellar with an... Wait, what? Is that an Italy? Uh, oh wow, that is in Italy. Um, 
I think they're looking for maybe something like the Jarvan, because Jarvan and Meth is like a really strong combo. But with Thresh being picked up, that you know decreases the value of the Jarvan a lot. So yeah. I was, I'm assuming that's why they do this to save the uh, pick support early and just. Yeah. Um. Interesting, but if I'm not mistaken, this is probably the first Nidalee in SLE, or at least in the modern modern times of SLE, this is the first time Nidalee has come out. Um, you're a jungle man yourself. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this champion? Uh, Nidalee. Nidalee is a very strong champion, in, especially in the early game. She's really fast and she's really uh, mobile. She also has uh, really strong invades and really strong early skirmishes. She is a champion that needs to heavy snowball. So if you don't get the ball rolling in the early game, your champion is going to be very close to useless. So this is uh, you know, a factor you have to consider in, and this might might be why they're drafting more Svein Misfortune, where they're looking for the team fight comp. If Nidalee can't carry the early game and just win them the game, they have this backup plan in the Svein in the MF, where it's more of like a press R, we just win the fight comp. So yeah, a little bit of a high risk. Uh, you know, investment here, and then the, the rest of the team is kind of like just banking off their kits. Yeah, definitely. And actually, one thing I was about to say is Interstellar, with the Nidalee knocked in on three, this almost spells like you kind of need to target that Renekton ban, but it has gone through. And Renekton Nidalee, not not particularly in this meta, but in previous metas, has been a, a top jungle duo that has worked extremely well. And he, 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 off broadcast, we said, this, this uh, Slime Odds top jungle is probably their stronger side, so they could potentially go for that. Yeah. I was a surprised to see the Cassio hover there, since they're already a little bit AP here, but switching on to the Zays here. Uh, it gives some poke, gives some space uh, for the team, so it makes a lot of sense here. And But yeah, I would have yeah. probably liked to see the Red on first. It's like a very strong blind pick. Like, it doesn't have a lot of like obvious counters, and the synergy you get from the Nidalee J uh, ranked is just yeah, yeah. too high value, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Wait, apparently slim odds. Yeah, it apparently is it odds. is slim odds. Oh, so it's yeah, not yeah. slim odds. Yeah, that was a mistake that was made uh, by the casters a lot uh, during the first three weeks. But it is slim odds. <laughs> okay, slim odds. I, I like slim odds. Um, yeah, no, good point. But you know, with the Jace locked in, we are looking at a bit of a poke composition here, and um, and I think right now it's looking really good because Interstellar are lacking any form of hard engage. Yeah, this really seems kind of interesting to me because I do believe it's a good uh, lane versus the Jace. Uh, and I don't know if they believe Svein is going to be mid lane here, but it's, in my opinion, it could still be support with like MF. So, if yeah. this is uh, really is meant to go mid lane against the Jace, this could be, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, genuinely, this is the, the power of flex because, because what they can do here is that they can take that Jace into the top lane, lock in a Renekton, and then put that Renekton up against the Aurelia. And that is one of the worst matchups Aurelia I can ever think of. So, yeah. uh, and same odds. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, look, five pick here is going to be the Olaf. Uh, thank you, Val, here uh, for that. Uh, oh. But yeah, oh. this also means that the really is probably going mid lane here. So if I was Slim Odds here, I would put this Vayne support, the Jace top lane with Face Rush against this Olaf, so he's very safe, and just get another pick. Yeah, a little bit of a. Hmm, interesting. I don't know about this one, because in my opinion, this is a good lane for Jax until level five, and then for the rest of the game, he loses. So yeah, really just I... depending on how well he can play a top lane here. I'm a little bit sad because this game literally had R5 Renekton spelt all over it. This was good matchups for him, uh, especially into the earlier. He had the setup with the Nidalee, uh, but you know, nonetheless, they've gone for a Jackson. They, 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 they've gone for what they've practiced, I'm assume, assuming. But uh, I want to add some context to a champion that has been picked here. It's the Aurelia. It's a Dorzo. He doesn't have the largest champion pool in the SLE, but on his champions, and you know, ask myself, ask Mikis, he is a former Gucci player. He is one of the best in the league. Genuinely can contest the top of the SLE. Uh, and he's got his Aurelia here today. And maybe Az can touch on Aurelia versus Jace. What are the win conditions here? And what does he need to do to put in an MVP performance? I mean, this matchup is a lot harder in the mid lane than it usually is in the top lane due to the length of the lane. So it's in the mid lane, it's, I would assume it's a lot more favorable for the Jace uh, than it, it would be in the top lane. Uh, due to Jace having better short traits, and these extended traits are really good for Aurelia. So I would assume she's looking for some, you know, small freezes or like some gang setups where she just gets to punish the Jace. Uh, but other than that, I think it's going to be really hard for this Aurelia to actually get some kills unless she could get some really strong lady faces or she gets some good, you know, synergy or setup for the Wukong. 
Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good uh, point to talk about the length of the lane because Aurelius Q, a lot of the times you, you end up behind your opponent and Jace, you transform into hammer form, press the E and Aurelius under your enemy turret, tanking the, the full tower shot. So uh, it is risky. You definitely have to play scarce. Um, and, you know, even if you set up a freeze, I think, like, Jace's range, you can just kind of Q from afar, EQ from afar, and try and get that wave in. So, um, yeah, very, it's it's very interesting, in my opinion, to see how matchups differ, like, literally just because of uh, the difference in length of lane. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, I want to ask you, we see both drafts, well, uh, we, I don't have the Olaf on the screen, but that is an Olaf. Is there a particular draft you are favoring so far? I mean, so far, it looks to me like Slimovs has a really strong early game here in the fact that all of their lanes are probably going to get the prior priority early. So this makes the uh, game very easy to play. And if they just play heavy off this uh, strong early game lanes, I think this Nidalee is just going to run away with it. If, yeah, well, he's like comfortable on this. Like This is a hard champ to uh, pilot. It's a champ you see with a lot higher win rate when people have more games or like they're in higher elos. So... If they can play well off this team comp, I would actually favor them a lot because running away with this game should be very easy when you have this range and you have this early game. Yeah, I have to agree. And actually, you know, one one lane I, I haven't really talked about too much is, is the bot lane here because Swain Misfortune up against a Kaiser. Kaiser, not the longest range ADC. Uh, Swain Misfortune is insanely oppressive in lane. Yeah, definitely. And that's just, you know... Very similar to something like the Israel Kama, where it's just really hard poking, and most of this is definitely coming from the Swain. But MS All In is really strong, and yeah. she is also very fast. So getting hit by these hooks is also going to be, you know, quite easy to dodge right to the moment speed from the W, and just the overall bulkiness that Swain has. So I think this is a just a kind of all winning lanes, uh, at least in the early game, where Aurelia really, can't really contest mid wave because of its range advantage. And same thing with Olaf because he can't fight into the. Counter Strike from the Jacks. So just having only winning lanes early just makes the game so much easier for Nidalee. And I don't see a lot of plays here they can like make. So maybe like an invade here or something, because they do have a decent level one, but early game is gonna be really rough for Interstellar in my opinion. Yeah, really rough and uh, you know, that's Swain and Misfortune. I you know, I just just thought about how how lethal of a combination this can be. Once that level six hit, Swain pops the ult, runs like a be beams forward, hits hits an E, and th that misfortune ult will completely shred you apart. So uh, really nice combinations. Um No, so 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 you mentioned slim odds much better in the early game. Is there a mid to late game scaling angle for Interstellar here? Oh yeah, definitely. What Interstellar has is kind of more of like a run you down comp, which generally is better into poke. As we see, you know, Svein has his W for poke, Misfortune has some decent range, but not really. But it's more of like the Needly and the Jace just tossing their, you know, high range Qs and working that. So I think this Wukong is going to be what we're really looking out for. Can he get some really solid flanks and can he get some good angles to look for? Because if you get the Wukong ulti onto three, four people, then Kaiser just jumps in. Olaf runs you down with Aurelia and it just suddenly looks really hard to play. Because this team fight, Jace is not really that good if everyone's coming from around him. Same thing with MF. Jax might be okay. Svein might be okay. But yeah, like I think this 5v5, especially if you can look get flanked from Lukong, it's going to be really oppressive. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. Uh, good point to add. Interstellar, they can just beam forward. They can look for an aggressive uh, all-in. And looking at the Slim Odds uh, composition, outside of the Swain, these are all champions that don't fall into the tanky category. Uh uh, Jace, Nidalee, Misfortune, these are these are three units, in my opinion, that you, you can one-shot if you find the angle, so definitely we'll have to be uh, careful to, to not get jumped on, and flank angles would be big for Interstellar. Yeah. Something I'd like to see, something we've seen before in SLE, where, you know, some, someone like Loco did it last season, right, where when they're on this hook champions, and they're just getting pick after pick, and they're just yeah. punishing really over-aggressive musicians, and as you said, these characters, if they get hooked, and someone is nearby, like, if this uh, Thresh gets hooked, or if Thresh gets a hook on Nidalee, MFJs, whatever, next to a Kai'Sa and a Wukong, she's gonna de be dead before the death sentence ends, and it really does become a death sentence at that point. Yeah, exactly, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uh, pressure onto this Aurelia pick to make it work. You saw the Jace, you've picked the Aurelia into the Jace, so it's something that Zodorzo definitely wanted and was confident in doing. Um... I uh, think that there's going to be a lot on him because I feel like on Aurelia in this game, if you fall behind in the early, it's going to be really tough for you to, to play out these team fights. Yeah, definitely. Aurelia, a champion that's really known for early game, especially, you know, the memes of the I'm full item on Ramsep, I'm full item on BT. 
or not BT, <laughs> sorry, Borg. Uh, yeah. So those spikes are going to be really important, and I'm, you know, I'm excited to see how he gets there and how he plays when he actually gets there, because this is a again very mechanical champion to play. Yes, uh, this is a great draft because on one side, great team fighting, great scaling. On one side, fantastic early game, long range poke. Um, but one thing we haven't touched on is is a one throw one here because I think both teams have a viable split push angle. Uh, it's just, I think, potentially Interstellar is slightly stronger with the Aurelia. So, I mean, like, if we did enter a one through one, who, who would you favor in that sense? The one through one is very interesting because, you know, Stuff like Kai's and Vulcan kind of want to play together and play a 5v5, but something I got really all of is better in, you know, the smaller skirmishes, like the 2v2s, the 3v3s. So, really hard to say, because Jax in itself doesn't really beat all of that game unless he's ahead. Same thing with Jace. And going into the side lane against this Aurelia is going to be really hard for the Jace, as, you know, you go into the longer lane, we mentioned that earlier. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know, this could really go either way, to be honest. I think it really just depends on how well the early mid game goes to see who gets fed, who gets strong, and, you know, yeah, it's super important. And, uh, you know, I mean, slim odds, honestly, as I said, they've got a composition which is quite all rounded. They, they can do one through one. It will be difficult, but obviously they can also pivot to let's just poke our opponent opponents to death uh just you know group together as, as yeah. five and throw our stuff as uh we are in to the game and A's, i want to get your predictions on who is going to take this first game yeah uh i i had a uh, before the you know the draft was made here i had the install to take it to all but after the draft i'm i think i'm gonna have to go with slim odds these confidence yeah. in the oh we've seen a lot of mate here yeah, a little bit invaded. A ward is going to be dropped, so just a uh, free, free little ward for Hyolan to pick up. And uh, yeah, really nice. Uh, oh my <laughs> gosh. And hopefully that's my, what we, you know, we're looking to see for. Like, I, th I hope we see more of those during the game, because I want to see this Nidalee being very aggressive. Yeah, definitely. And uh, hopefully, yeah, as you said, a uh, good sign of things to come. Uh, Nidalee, not a champion that is too favored amongst teammates i know a lot of junglers enjoy this champion um what wh what should the early game of this nidalee look like i mean generally speaking you want to do a good reading here of where do you think the enemy jungler is going to go because if you think he's got a path butt side here i would love to see an invade after nidalee here so you could even do blue buff into red side red buff and then just kill him on the raptors or so we have a little technical issue with the I believe it was the frames. Yeah, and that's fixed now, but yeah. Uh, again, this ward on the blue buff here, I do believe they know it's here. So it might be a little hard to just walk straight into red buff here, as it's gonna be just like a normal clear, I guess, yeah. And this is like the thing with Nidalee, where you have a really fast clear, so you can always just do that. But normally you do generally want to just invade or like be a really menace here. Oh, and actually already, and I'm looking at some bot lane fights, as you can see, Stoosh has already ex spelled the heal so summon a spell down for uh slime mods in the bot uh, slim mods in the bot lane as that uh, so he's gonna land an e and uh, early aggression in bot yeah i think this is really just a case of you know something a lot of the uh, junglers are gonna love and a lot of laners are gonna hate is that leashing leashing is really bad for the lane but really good for the jungler in certain situations so here in the lane we talked about might should have had you know prior that suddenly doesn't have prior anymore because they couldn't hit the lane first yeah, I think um, I think naturally when you're drafting for a Nidalee, you want to make sure that the Nidalee has the advantage. Um, unfortunately, Stoosh and General Decoy, they are missing two summon spells because I've actually just noticed the Ignite is gone. So a small disadvantage for them. King Valhe used his Ignite as well. But um, yeah, so early action to kick off with. And I think, uh, I mean, we can probably expect the, I mean, looking at the pathing, um, this Nidalee is heading towards that top lane already. Uh, yeah. And uh, Wukong is on bot side, so uh, kind of on opposite sides of the map here. Yeah, and with how low Olaf's HP is at this point, no TP, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a, a dive here at some point. And I also kind of want to take a look at the bot wave real quick, because I do believe they actually end up getting a really solid freeze here. Yeah, they do. After that, they early start getting this freeze. It's really important for them, and that's going to be probably going to be huge in the next few minutes. Yeah, definitely important. And. Uh... Uh, whenever whenever it comes to freezes, it's very common that in higher levels, uh, how do the laners utilize the position of your jungler to fix the waves? As uh, Hyolan is actually in bot lane. The play is not going to land, but General Decoy, you're on your own. Level 2 against 
three and level three so we'll see if a flash is going to be blown general decoy holding that for now and he's going to use the never move not going to land but uh, in the end saves himself a flash but stoosh crucially loses his yeah good uh next if you see i mean maybe saw a little small rotation coming in for the let's see maybe some aggressive trading here yeah, aggressive training. Banarex is going to jump forward, lands the stun. Nidalee is here, so the spear is going to land, and that's going to be first blood going over to Banarex. Wow, really amazing spear here coming out from the Nidalee. Actually curving it a little bit under and forcing the Olaf to either hit the Jax or dodge the spear. Uh, Olaf doesn't really dodge the spear, he still has both summoners as well, so maybe a little bit of a misplay here, but, all, but really good read by Nidalee here to just come and cover it, the aggressive trade. And with Olaf no TP, this is going to be a huge wave to lose. Yeah, huge wave, and this, this I, I've seen a few times now, SLE top lane is not going for the teleport, and a lot of the times, the jungler will just look at him and be like, he's got no TP, just gank him early, he's gonna lose a big, he doesn't lose too much heroes, actually, there's a 2v2 in bot lane, Stoosh is left on a 1v2 against Algren, he will get himself a kill, but King Val here cleans it up, so a 2 for 1 for the interstellar bot lane, and the, crucially, look at this wave that Stoosh is gonna miss. Yeah, if Valhir can get this on the turret, it's got to be really massive for Interstellar, and especially in the bot lane here. This is a lot of CS, a lot of EXP missing out, and you see the Kaisers already at level up on uh, the Misfortune, so same thing with the Thresh, right? So just really huge advantage right here. Yeah, massive advantage, and uh, I mean, two sides of the coin, slim odds, get an advantage in top lane, and uh interstellar get advantage in bot lane but i think more crucially i want to look at the uh i mean there's a massive wave but uh, a bit of a lead building up for zadorzo in the mid uh, in the mid lane here um as uh, actually panning over snidgen is arriving in mid lane as we see the aurelia ult is being used the mana is low so i'm not sure if zadorzo can make this play he actually jumps forward onto snidgen picking himself up one kill he's got some ammunition in the in the weights with his teammates, but it's just gonna be the one kill as Hook is gonna go wide. Zadorzo showing his mechanics in a one versus two. Yeah, really impressed as well because he has not backed yet. So this is oh. a one versus two against uh, double ba base, and we yeah. see more aggressive in here. More action in the bot lane as General Decoy is oh. gonna be brought to one HP. King Valher not gonna land the death sentence, so he gets away with his life. But that pressure and a kill in the mid lane means the dragon is gonna be opened up. As uh, Banarex gets another kill in top lane. Yeah, this is the thing with this matchup where in the statue, if you get ahead on one side, it's really easy to just steamroll it down. And in the moment you have a good lane state where you can just, you know, run at him in a straight line, it becomes really hard yeah. to actually defend it. Yeah, really difficult. And uh, I think w one thing we need to look at is uh, uh, Ginny on this Jace here. Uh, he's not going to be ahead anymore since that Aurelia, as you can see on your screen, is what a lot of people would consider four builds <laughs> um <laughs> so jace a little bit behind and what i'm curious to see is whether or not this jace plays to try and push a lead or plays to cut the losses as much as he can yeah definitely really hard laning at this point in the game because yeah as you said in the full build but also already down 30 cs and then the exp advantage you also get from getting that kill on in italy while also decreasing Nidalee's tempo by killing her. So just a lot of wins here coming out from that, uh, you know, solo play from Sido. Yeah, a lot of wins, but we can see already Snitchin on the Nidalee doing so much damage with those spears. And uh, I think this is one of those sort of measurements when we get the Nidalee. It's like uh, some of the best Nidalees I've seen, especially in pro play, they just go from lane to lane whilst they're clearing, uh, doing the clear, just chucking spears and poking out laners. Uh, comes really frustrating for them as uh, one thing I've noticed on my mini map is some movements towards banner action the top lane as a wave is stacking into him but I, I don't think it will lead to anything yeah something you definitely don't want to see as uh, interstellar here is a strong Jax because Jax is a champion that's really good into almost every single one of if not all of your champions actually here Jax has a good matchup into both Wukong, Irelia and Kaiser to some extent so this Jax is like maybe where you want to put your extra slimmers because he has a good like individual matchup against almost every single one of Interstellar champions. So getting this Jax ahead could really be their win con at this point in the game already. Yeah, it could be. And uh, actually, 
I gotta mention Zadorto again. This is what I meant by you give him one of his champions, and he is probably one of the best in the league. He's on around 10 CS per minute, one and zero in this lane, and uh, yeah, Jin Jenny really struggling uh, in mid lane right here. As a, there's a potential dive, General Decoy is not level six, so it's just going to walk into his death. And that was a little bit careless from the Swain, as he uh, just kind of that looked suspicious, didn't it? Yeah, seems to be a little bit of miscommunication here because it looks like they wanted to dive with the Nidley, but the Nidley was doing the crux still, and there's like then the Thresh, Thresh come in last second, and it just seemed very flustered and rushed. So, looks like a little bit of miscommunication there going in from Slimots. Yeah, it looks quite funny because he sort of just ran in and died. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, I mean, one thing I have to point out is uh, Zadorzo. Uh, in the last two or so minutes, has sort of um, done what can be really frustrating to play against, where he just kind of shoves the wave, creates pressure on the map, moves away from mid lane, and walks around the jungle. And it's kind of like, when you're playing against this, your mid laner will be like, I really miss it. I'm going to stop myself. As Yarlan has interacted with Banarex. Banarex on low HP, going to use the stun to try and buy himself some time. Yarlan falls with the flash and going to secure himself the kill. So that's the shot down onto the Jax. And uh, Death Sentence doesn't land, but yeah, the Jax getting killed by the Wukong there. Yeah, Banorex here not, not holding his nerf there. Maybe was a little too scared that the bush was warded and thought he could get out anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't warded. Can't really know that. But good punish here from uh, Yalan. And this is what you want to see from Slim. Or, uh, sorry, Interstellar is that they're punishing this quote unquote win con on the Jax that has a decent matchup into most of the champions. So a good read for them on the map here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, right now. You know, you mentioned earlier in the game, or oh, before the game started, that it's really important for this Nidalee to get him, get himself ahead early. And uh, right now, just uh, doesn't like alert. Yes, you're ahead on farm, but it's just not not quite uh, working as as much as they wanted to. Definitely. Also, maybe something else due to him not being able to play as aggressive as he might have wanted to due to, well, this strong mid lane that. Uh this performance that Orso is putting out here so far. So it looks like even from like level one, both his bot lane and mid lane actually didn't have the prior that I, at least in my opinion, they sh I think they should have had. So could be a reason why the Nilly hasn't felt maybe as free to do what she normally would do. Yeah, and uh, definitely as a draw, so playing super, uh, super, super well in this game. Look at that CS number, a very rare sight to see in the SLE a lot of the times. Farm numbers is the one criticism that a lot of SLE players get. Uh, Zadorzo. Making a name for himself here with uh, those uh, good laning phase, I guess you could say, is that Snidgen will provide some support to Banner X here. I do not think Marcus has any information on this. Yeah, I think if you're Banner X here, you jump into him, make like an awkward trade, make it look like you're gonna, that was a stupid decision, bait her back to Nidalee, and then you have a really strong lane gank here. Yeah, and uh, as that's happening, a Herald has been spawned in the mid lane, and it's actually gonna be a shutdown. Stoosh gets a kill onto Algren. Uh, so that is a big shutdown going over to the hands of Misfortune. Plates go down for Interstellar uh, as action happens all around the map. Oh, Banarax jumping in onto Marcus. That's a heavy trade. No response from Snitchin so far. The spear is going to land right into the eyes of Marcus as he's forced to flash away. And uh, Dragon gets shotted up on the other side with the information that Nidalee is in top lane. Yeah. They almost did exactly what I was talking about there, where they kind of make the awkward trade and bait it look like it was a bad decision, and then Nidalee comes out. As oh, and actually it. a dive, but it goes wrong! Snedjen is going to jump forward to secure himself the kill, but more importantly, Bannerex falls down in the one versus two. Yeah, a uh, little bit funky there. They end up getting, like, you know, the kill. He loses some CS here, so probably overall still okay with the top side. But with bot side here getting the Drake, it's two Drakes to none. Uh, in like a more team fight heavy comp, this is looking very scary for Slim Ops all of a sudden. Yeah, very kind of scary indeed. And you said it was so critical for Slim Ops to make sure that they won the early game. And it's not happening for them right now. So when it comes to scaling, what, is, what does this mean for them? Yeah. I mean, I think what they're looking to do now maybe is like playing a little bit more for the poke. Uh, they still have a, you know, good range with the... Svein has some decent poke, especially if he's going with the Snyder's build, but also just primarily the Nisi Lily Spears, who has so far he's shown he can hit, and then this Jace poke that's gonna be better and better for each item he gets. 
Yeah, I think right now... Oh, actually, Zadorzo going in for a heavy trade onto Ginny. This won't be pushed any forward, but we see those Aurelia mechanics. I'm telling you guys, Zadorzo on his champions is one of the best that we have, and uh, he's really, really showing... Like, that trade right there shows exactly why. Yeah, and after getting this base with the... Actually, she's my aggressive. No, yeah. it's just gonna be a good trade down. Ooh. Oh, actually, Banarax turning back around. Marcus doesn't have the flash available. The ghost is a bit too late. So Banarax picks himself up another solo kill. Hyalan has arrived, does have the flash coming up soon. Won't need to use it. The teleport gets used to shove the wave in, and Hyalan gets himself 2 and 0 oh, onto the board. Yeah, a little bit could have maybe weaved in a better auto there for Banarax, and good realization that's saying, okay, well, there's no reason to give Aurelia more kills. So if he's gonna CP. I'm just gonna let him get out the wave and give Wukong the kill. Yeah, and Hyalan, look at him go. He is making sure that he is reacting well to the movements. Oh Ooh. my god! King Vela almost predicts Ginny's flash. And with... <laughs> that would have been crazy. And uh, he will be able to get himself out. But uh, yeah, great, great map rotations coming out from Interstellar. Yeah, they'll hear feel, feel a little frisky there, uh, saying... Feels comfortable enough in the game to say, I'm going for a little bit of a highlight play here. I can definitely respect that. You know, you, you press tab, you see you're really this strong. You, you like you have a decent uh, James, you have two drakes. So maybe a little frisky there and not doing the quote unquote correct play. But I, I love to see that. Yeah, it's fantastic to see. I, I like the confidence. And, you know, if, if that had landed, <laughs> that would be one of the craziest plays we would have seen. And uh, Interstellar, we got to say, you know, there have been great plays coming out from Banarax and Snidgen Spears have been landing. Some nice CV2s from Stoosh, but when it comes to the mid jungle control that Interstellar have, two dragons on the board, I believe that's the second Herald in their hands. Interstellar definitely controlling the early game here. Definitely. And something we saw, like a bit of a repeating theme here, we saw it last, uh, last week as well, were these solo laners, maybe not as much top lane this time, but Sedar also here really popping off here and maybe kind of just taking the game on his back so far. And I mean, these so solo laners are. A threat at least, because even with the Olaf here, he's not down CS. Like he's down seven CS. Yeah, that's fine. But with the attention, the amount of attention Banarax has gotten here, he's actually in a really good spot. Really good spot indeed. And um, actually, we you know, we talked earlier about split pushing, and you know, as it stands, we see already Banarax is winning heavily onto these duels against Marcus. So if he gets that matchup in the side lane up against him, it will be very dangerous for Interstellar to just ignore. But they will send the Zadorzo to match Banarex here. As a, there is a fight in the mid lane. Algren is gonna go down to the Ignite. General Decoy will follow. And look at Yalan on the Wukong. Three kills for him. And speaking about good performances, it's not just the solo lanes. Yalan on this Wukong is playing immensely well. Yeah. Yalan uh, and the Zuga just being whatever he needs to be. Uh, always there to like claim the counter gank or like claim the revenge kill. Bit of a, an Avenger theme he's going with here. So, yeah, I mean, just a really good map read here. Maybe a little slow in some places. You could argue that he should be on the places faster, but at least really well reactions and he's getting a lot of the value for his team. As we might be chasing that now. Yeah, it won't be much. Um... But yeah, once again, we see even even uh, that, that how strong Banner X is actually managing to get the push onto Zadorzo, who is uh, probably one of the Fed members on uh, Interstellar's side as he's keeping up that 10 CS lead. But um, I mean, we'll see. I can so imagine that if Zadorzo and Banner X enters a duel, it will be quite interesting to see as uh, it could potentially happen. Zadorzo walking into the bush, Banner X landing the initial damage. The stun goes off as well, and we see the power of this Jackson. Not even Zadorzo can match up to him. Yeah, and this is what I talked about earlier, right? Where this Jax just has a really favorable matchup. When you have a player that's King Champions that's really relying on getting auto attacks and Qs, and Jax just has a nah -uh button, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. it becomes really hard to all of a sudden turn play. So, you're really good that you shut him down. <laughs> yeah, so, excited to see what they're going to do with this Drake, though, because these individual Drakes are not necessarily that good for uh, Slim Mods, so they could trade them for more value and just play off a gold lead, or, or they could just try and fight them here. They do have a strong 5v5, right? But. Yeah, so does. Marcus already pushing forward and gonna land an axe onto Stoosh. That's gonna be crucial as there goes Zedorzo under the enemy turret, picking himself up the second kill of his game. And uh, that's not gonna be any response as uh, Snidgen and his squad will have to retreat. Banarex has arrived onto the scene, but it's just gonna be a mid lane turret secured as uh, Interstellar, they get to the objective first and are able to make a play. Yeah, looks like uh, Simmods is not done with this yet. They're 
slowly like taking some space, trying to poke them out, seeing what's uh, free. And it looks like they still want to contest this 4v5, which is very interesting at least, but... Yeah, they are in the area, and uh, as they slowly realize this dragon has slipped out of their hands, they will concede it and try to push the mid lane wave instead. But crucially, Interstellar secure themselves soul point, which uh, will be big for them going into the mid to late game. Yeah, and unlike Slimots, this uh, dragon is actually really good for them. Yeah, they have a lot of life steal, especially on this Olaf, uh, Vulcan, Aurelia. And they also kind of bruise so heavy in a way yeah. where they do not mind fighting on low HP, where this Drake and the Soul really pops off. So, really strong Drakes for Interstellar, and this is a rare occurrence when you have this Chemtech Drake. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And uh, one thing that I have noticed is uh, the sort of increase in purchase of Tab Eyes, or I guess it's called uh, Plated Steel Caps in this game. Um, That's the Tab Eyes. I refuse. <laughs> yeah, Tavi is being purchased on both solo laners, and I guess you can understand it. But nonetheless, I, you know, Algren Kaiser, a champion that fits really well into what on paper looks like full AD team compositions because of the mixed damage that she provides. Yeah, definitely. And Tavi is also something I got a lot of. Uh, like, you got a really minor change, but actually ended up being a really buff. Where stuff like Wukong Q, stuff like Jax W, stuff like uh, Aurelia Q also gets the damage, and you know. Uh, damage reduction from the 12%, and it didn't use to do that, and I know a lot of players were confused by that. So, a few patches go, Tabas got really strong. Yeah. Very, very, very good value, especially in this game, it gets up against basically five auto-attackers, right? Um, yeah. uh, and uh, so, one, one game stage that we've entered now, and one thing that you said is going to be interesting, is uh, seeing the split push side lanes, because the Jace is stronger the, than the Olaf, and the Jax we've seen can win out the trades up against the Aurelia. So, if they carry on like this, this could be Slim Odd's way of getting back into the game. But uh, you know, as, as soon as I started speaking, uh, I saw them both reset and then <laughs> group up together. So, that probably won't happen. But um, yes, Slim Odd's, what are they going to need to do to uh, even this game out? Yeah, so the scary thing for Slim Odd's is that they also don't have a lot of Baron damage. So, it's really hard to say, let's send Jax bot lane and just do the Baron if they show two people more. Because, as you know, they, they don't have a Kai'Sa, they don't have a Vayne, they don't have a Kog'Maw. This is the MF and it's a Lethality MF, so their damage to Sire is not going to be strong. I do believe they in sites, they can shove out sites and then look for, you know, a bit of a, you know, a box them in in a way, where you can get some flanks on them, like you can get this Jackson from the side, and maybe get a 4v5 because you punish this no TP Olaf, and I think that's the way they're going to win. Yeah, damn, that's a very, very good point. And uh, one thing I've, already seen, I, I've just seen on my screen is... Um, so Aurelia is a champion, I think, that probably has the most amount of mythics that work on, on Aurelia. And, uh, you, you know, you can go Gore Drink. I've seen people go Triforce. Uh, what's that thing called? The Divine Sunderer. I've seen people... I mean, I've seen some Stride Breakers here and there. Uh, and uh, Zadorzo with the Jack Show. I think really good pick. Uh, good decision here to go Jack Show up against a poke composition. Just because, you know, what's a poke composition if you're too tanky, so... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for making an argument that Stripe Breaker kind of does the same thing, and it also makes it easier to stay too. But yeah, definitely don't mind this choice at all. And, you know, just being able to... Because uh, we said it earlier, right? Aurelia on Bla Blathering King is full build. So everything else is just a luxury, right? It's like buying pots at this point. So she bought her yeah. first potion here in the Jack Show, and she's going to look to be strong with that. Yeah, look, looking strong indeed. And, uh, you know, actually, an another thing I want to talk about on the other side is you said at the start of the game... In Italy, you were talking about the pros and cons of Vanilla Italy, and uh, not looking too good so far. Nah, this Sage, you're, can you're a bit of a glorified cannon minion, so this pokes <laughs> does hurt. They don't hurt a lot. No, they don't hurt too much as uh, a Baron was started up by Slim Odds, and Algren and Kjallan are pushing towards Ginny here on the chase, but the Baron will be left alone for now as. Uh, there was a contest, a soft one, but um, naturally you do not want to be tanking the objective up against a poke composition, so they will just back off for now. Yeah, something that definitely hurts is this Baron, as they don't have a, you know, full, full tank. They have a lot of bruises here, so no one should just stand there like an Orin or a Cyan to just say, well, I don't take damage from this anyway. Just hit me and we do it. So, yeah, that's a, that's the scary thing about playing against these co composition when you don't have a full committal tank, is that you who is really going to tank this poke? Sure, yeah. probably prefers it over the Kai'Sa, but I think no one really wants to get hit by this poke. 
Yeah, no, no one indeed is. We see, we see Snidgen, and this is the difficulty with Nidalee, is when it gets to this stage of the game, people get movement speed, people complete their tier 2 boots, it can be very easy to dodge these Nidalee spears. As uh, you can imagine, this dragon is so important for slim mods to make sure that they do not leave in the hands of Interstellar. Ooh, oh, great oh, second bell here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I think the focus here should be the Jax here for Slimoth and for it. It's sort of like, how do we make sure that this Jax doesn't just 1v9 us, kinda. He is on yeah. these two items here with the Jax, though, but so is everyone else. But this is really the time he needs to spike. Yeah, time is of the essence as the dragon is actually just gonna go down. No contest from Slim Odds. The bullet time isn't quite good, but look at Battle Rex landing all the damage onto the back line of Interstellar. Algren is gonna pick up a kill onto Stooge, but he's trying his best. Zadorzo trying his best, but Battle Rex is just too goddamn strong. Algren picks himself up two kills on the enemy back line, but look at the solo laners of Slim Odds as they run down the Interstellar squad. Yeah, great fight here come out the mods. A little too late on the trigger, end up losing the Drake, and this is a really strong Drake for Interstellar. But as you know, we said this before the fight, right? This Jax just goes unleashed and then he's just a machine. And that's what they really need to win these fights. And going forward here into this Baron here, I'm hoping to see more of that. Yeah, but essentially Algren, he 1v2 the back line of uh, yeah. Slimmons, and I'll let you break this down. I mean, yeah, you see, the they just want to split up the fight. They don't want to make sure the Jax can't just A, kill everyone. So they're just kind of saving their loss here. They already got what they came for. They got the Drake. And the rest of this is just, well, we end up getting it 3 for 3, I believe. Yeah, yeah 3. Um, is it? Oh, yeah, it's 3 for 3. Yeah. And the Drake. So they're more than happy with this. And next fight with the Soul, every time the Jax is somewhat close to killing them, they suddenly start taking 11% less damage and they heal more. So this is suddenly very hard to kill. And with this Baron coming up, I'm assuming we're going to see another fight, but I don't believe this is going to be as close. Yeah, probably not. Stoosh already getting jumped on by Aldrin, and that's just going to be a one-shot killing spree on the Kaiser. And a double kill onto the Slim Mods bot lane. Snidgen and Banorex has all arrived. The Baron gets started up into Stella. There won't be much of a response here, and it's three versus five. The poke is not quite landing all already. Ginny and Sunijin, keep your eyes on them. Banarex probably not going to be able to do much. And look at these spears. They are doing nothing. The jump in is too late. And the Baron gets secured. And Ginny on the run, being chased by King Valher and Co. The chase is going to fall. That's going to be his first death of the game. But crucially, the Baron has been secured. Interstellar win the fight. And Algren stepping up for his team. Yeah. I mean, been a little bit of a quiet game here, but he spent last fight he was there, and he's been there passively every fight. Also, interesting, he doesn't go with the new build with the um, well, more like the fatal line. He's still going the old school with static shift and Nash tooth. So he does have some counter poke towards this Jace and Nidalee as well. Uh, but they this all in against the Lefeldi misfortune, who's not cracking Slayer, who's not like anything there like that. You just if you get on top of her, you just always gonna win that one run. Yeah, and I have to say. We look at the itemization from Slimbox. They have itemized, like, there's a lot of armor, there's a lot of plated steel caps, and it, it makes sense, right? You're up against full auto attack team. But the thing with Kaisen, we mentioned earlier, that, that Nash's Tooth provides you with AP damage and mixed damage, and similar to the likes of Corky, you know, it's so good to be the solo AP damage dealer for this Kaisen. We are really seeing the crazy DPS she's able to output. Yeah, and especially with no one actually being able to build tank is just makes it so yeah. that it's a lot harder like i, I do believe jax is going for what's end here but generally speaking if you're not a tank it's really hard to actually access mr without bu bu buying like a single with send or a maw or something so she's just gonna do a lot of damage yeah a lot of damage and actually i i want to bring attention to something that uh oh actually snidgen and king valho will just uh look at each other and run away um Oh my god, so the spears do hurt if they land as uh, I'm watching in the bot lane Harlan and Banarex into a fight. Harlan realizing Banarex is the strong one on the enemy team, so we'll run away up until he gets reinforcement. So it's Algren, King Valher, and Hyalan up against this Jax here. And he's actually putting up a decent fight, but it's not going to be enough. Look at Algren dominating on the board, and this Kaiser is running rampant. Yeah, and this is a scary part of the Jax where you, you go into these three plus items, right? Like you're facing triple item on the uh, Kaisa here and she's just, the moment your E is out, she's just going to hit you with everything she got and you're just going to die because you're getting CC'd by the Wukong, or you're getting CC'd by the Thresh and you're getting hit by the Wukong, like the armor reduction, all of that is just, it makes it so much easier for them to kill you. 
Yeah, so much easier. And we, we talked about Interstellar's strengths as a team. It was, we were talking, we mentioned the door zone, we mentioned Marcus. One player we didn't really talk about is Algren, and this time around, the solo lanes of Interstellar have been a little bit quiet this game in comparison Oof. to Algren. So he is stepping up big time, and you know, which one's the poke comp? Because Algren is putting down crazy damage from range. And uh, Slim Odds, they are on Slim Odds to win this game. Yeah, definitely. And Algren here, oh, we'll see you. Oh, Ooh, no. great flay coming great out play. from King Val here. So Banarax's engage will be null and void. The Shock Blast doesn't land. And uh, the key thing about poke comms is you have to make sure you hit your spells. And just what I've seen in some of these objective contests, the poke just isn't quite landing. No, the poke is landing and it's also really hard to make this poke stick. We mentioned it earlier, right? With this amount of healing that is on the Interstellar side and with the um, extra bulk they really just get from having these increased shields and heals, it's just really hard to, even if they do hit the poke, just make it stick as well. And with with them being the, you know, the defenders instead of the aggressors, it doesn't look just choose when to say, oh, well, we just got poked too much. We can just leave now. Yeah, genuinely. And, uh, yeah, I mean, talk about choosing when to do what and where that's all about control and interstellar in full control of this game right now and i just, I just have to feel snitching on this nidalee just not he just had didn't do enough in the early game he didn't have a composition that set him out well enough and uh right now as you said this nidalee is a walking ward but banarex has found himself an incredible position here and if he can get himself onto a key target this could spell big disaster because Yes, Interstellar are in control. Yes, they are ahead, but Banarex is by no means behind. Yeah, and this is something you also have to consider now, is that the group are good here. They realize, they realize the top lane, STP coming from behind. Yeah, he is jumping forward. Banarex, look at the damage that he can do. The death sentence is going to land on him. So keep your eyes on Algren. Zadorzo has access to the back line. Algren brought to half HP. Stooch with the bullet time isn't going to do enough. Kjallan picks him up. It's the second kill of this team fight. General Decoy on the run. And look at the poke champions of Slim Odds. Just left to run and not do anything that they can do. Ginny jumps forward trying to do as much as he can. But it's not going to do anything. Snidgen falls, one and four in the Nidalee. Ginny, you are going to run Algren on the chase. But more importantly, the Interstellar members are pushing down the base of Slim Odds. And this is going to be game one into the hands of Interstellar. Yeah, with GTB coming into the base here, but with this amount of HP, I don't believe there's anything you can do. And it's just going to be a clean game here. So they're still having a little bit of fun here, wanting to get the Elder. And now they're just padding the stats here. I mean, great game coming out from Interstellar here. Great game, and you have to say... You know, we talked about how this game, the drafts, were two sides of the coin. One late game, one early game. But somehow, Interstellar won the early game up against an, uh, an uh, early game team composition. So, great showing from them. And, you know, speaking of momentum, they will go into the second game with very high confidence. Yeah. And I do believe we're going to go on a break here. So, everyone, just relax. We're going to take a small break. Lean back in your chair. Get, a, get yourself a, what is it, a savage sandwich or... Some yummy yogurt, and we'll be right yes. back.
and welcome back, guys. We're here for the game two. Uh, but before going into the draft and anything, Adrian, Mr. Savonix, Mr. Gucci Hello. Man himself. Hello. What do you think about the first game here? Any changes you would make or anything going into the second game you would really consider? Or what are, you, what are your thoughts yeah. about it? Yeah, okay, listen. I understand, like, you know, Snidgen, Diamond 1 player. You are one of the highest ranks in the SLE. I guess you could say you are a S-tier player just based off ELO. But as I say a lot when I'm on cast, uh, there's a certain magic about the SLE. You could be 900 times better than your opponent, but it doesn't really matter. Like, no one cares. A, a, you know, a better team will, you know, completely diminish that. And what we saw there, the Nidalee pick just wasn't it. I get I get the confidence. I, I don't mind the confidence. But, you know, if, if you put yourself on a channel like that, you got to make it work. And, you know, I, I think it was, I think, I think the Swain outdamaged the Nidalee in that game. And Nidalee was, a, you know, a poke champion. And, you know, personally, if, you know, I was doing less damage than my support is definitely an indication to get off that champion or pronto, regardless of how good you are. So, I, honestly, second game going into this next one, you know, put some respect on your opponent's names because, you know, not only are you 0-1 down, it was a bit of a stomp and uh, that middle lead definitely has to go. Yeah, something like at least related to in our team uh, where we just pick champions that... You know, you have to play really clean on them, and there's like not a lot of room for mistakes. Nidalee is like the epitome of that. So, going into this game thinking you're gonna play a perfect game and you're gonna play like really like on the dot and just not leave a mistake to snowball this game into oblivion. It's I love it for the confidence, but I don't think it's a very valuable strategy. So, I, again, I agree. I would really like to see it go and maybe pick something more traditional. Uh, even with the Thresh there, I think Jarman was like a very good option because Thresh in the end can only land on one, so he still had the Jarman Misfortune combo. So maybe a little more teamfight heavy one that also has a strong early game, right? Like Jarman is definitely a stronger early game champion, but yeah. Yeah, much stronger indeed. And I think when, when we talk about top junglers in the SLE, and you can definitely contribute to this conversation here as a jungler yourself, um, I think there's a lot of uh, importance or I guess you could say reliance on being able to facilitate your team. And when we, you know, as I said, talking about top junglers in, in the SLE, I'm talking about the likes of Dutch in history. It's been the likes of Rango, Dutch himself, uh, you know, Obsidian was uh, in one split uh, at the top of the SLE. Uh, and the thing about all these players is it's very unlikely that they would, you know, go for a hype champion like in Italy. They They often just play very consistent champions, facilitation champions, and, you know, I mean, you know Dutch a lot as, like, well, you know, his strengths is what shines a lot in the SLE. Yeah, I agree. Not a lot of, you know, we don't see a lot of junglers here going for, like, the really hyper carry kind of potential that we see, you know, in solo queue where they, you know, I mean, I am, I'm the victim of that myself, right? I'm a Jarvan, or not a Jarvan, I'm a Karthazudia player, right? But mm -hmm. I think maybe the most recent Example of that is Arnfeld, I believe he is from Primordials, who was playing, you no, know, yeah. yeah, so he was like playing a lot of Shivana carry kind of style jungling. But most of the time, you see, you, you at the most, you see like an auction or something coming out from some people. Yeah. Uh, but that's again, it also has a lot of utility. It also has a, you know, a lot of like value because the ulti is so good. The you have a spell shield that can block damage. You have a uh, E that can like fear. So, but yeah. again, we saw last season a lot of Trundle, a lot of Poppy, a lot of Maokai, a lot of Sijani, right? These more facilitating, slow pacing, a place for the lanes. And that's just what we used to hear. Yeah, I mean, it, even the likes of JL, who is, you know, when we talk about ELO, similarly to Snidgen, a, a Diamond 1 player, so cream of the crop in the SLE. And, uh, you know, even he would uh, opt for, for the Sijuanis, the Maokais. And I think there's possibly a bit of advantage and you know you said you're an Uda player yourself a champion that kind of falls under this potential category of um in a way stat checking of like why not pick a champion that is just good solid in the meta and you can facilitate your team because at the end of the day you're a diamond one player the, you are better than the rest of your team why not be the person who sets up and enhances your teammates yeah Definitely. I mean, again, a lot of value. At least this is something in like my previous competitive experience is that when you pick these carry junglers and uh, you really need to pop off, you're also, your team really needs to have a deep understanding of what your champion does and how to play around that. And that's very you know unnatural for a lot of players where everyone agrees the jungle is a broken wall, but no one actually wants to play for the jungle because they're, you know, there's the, oh, well, AD carry is OP. It's a bot lane meta. It's uh, get drakes. And when you just need to get the drakes and you just need to have bot lane prior and this and that, 
it's very hard to play these things because you know you're you're on a timing you need to get your cs you need to get your cams oh we can't come he's ganking bot lane so i have to counter jungle there's no like oh i'm second camps to come counter gank so generally speaking uh you would probably see more of a traditional team heavy jungler rather than the hyper carry it's all me yeah definitely i, I have to agree and uh, i mean the the main reason why i bring this up it, it's so interesting to talk about the the angle of what junglers do and what works in the sle uh i mean i think it's a rare occasion that a, a carry pick works t too well but i mean going off that topic we're going into the second game now and one thing i've noticed in the sle is um whenever a team wins game one they get a little bit trigger happy uh, they go into the second game, they, they are you know off good momentum, off good spirits, and what they do is they draft a completely different team composition to what they did in the first game, and then the the, the series ends up one and one. So Interstellar going into this one, is it a rinse and repeat, or what do you think they need to, to be doing into this draft? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just going to be... I mean, something I could definitely say, like I've done before, where you're really confident, you're like, oh, these guys were ass, let's just, you know uh pick our whatever you want to do and just roll them get the game done in 20 but you have to keep the your head your you know your head all high like you're you need to be calm collected and just play a clean game because we're all in this league we're all like very similar and it's just who has the better team right it's a team game in the end and playing smart playing good playing you know preserved but still aggressive it's just finding that right balance and keeping that don't dropping it just because you win one game yeah definitely and uh you know maybe you can can add some info on this is usually when it comes to you're a cw champion you know all about series uh, when it comes to series what's the most important thing about making sure you win that whole thing because it's completely different to best of ones yeah definitely i think it's you know realization of strengths and weaknesses and comparing it to what your opponent has because a lot of times you're going to say well we're normally used to playing a really strong top side but you could say like oh well we kind of got rolled in top lane uh, but their, our buddy was kind of winning on default, so making adaptions just not based on what you have, but also based on what they have. Of course, you shouldn't drop every game plan and say, you know, we're playing, we're at 11, right? We're used to playing really strong tops only, so that's the only thing we can do. But, you know, you can make some arguments with it here or there, and just adapting in a way where you don't neglect your whole style, but you still, you know, make, you know, be realistic and say what's working, what's not working, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Draft comes through Interstellar talking about, you know, what you need to do to win series. And Kaiser Thresh, once again, they seem like uh, they are definitely adapting to to the series and, uh, you know, doing it all over once again. Yeah. I mean, again, it seems like the the Jarvan, uh, you know, the turn again with the Thresh being really good into Jarvan with both the Lantern, but also the, uh, the Flay that just negates his EQ. So. Yeah. So I didn't see the Hecarim though. Hecarim is a champion I very much enjoy. Uh, it falls a little bit on the same category as the carry jungler, but still, it still has some of the aspects of, you know, the kind of Jarvan where you're really fast and sneakily, but you're not as reliant on just farming and being aggressive because you have a lot of base, you know, utility in your kit. You have a big AoE fear, you have a knockback, you have healing, and you have decent damage. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, Talking about adapting throughout series, Slim Odds, I'm going to get your opinions on this. They have left the Kaiser open after that first game, and they've opted for a first pick return instead of taking it themselves. Is this something that you think they've got something prepared for this Kaiser, or do you think this will come to haunt them uh, throughout the second game? I think they felt like the Kaiser wasn't a big of a problem. If, and I, to be honest, it really only it was at a certain point in the game. And I think this draft, at least so far, makes a lot more sense, right? This draft is yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. Run, run towards him in a straight line and just use your ulties. Like Rakan has that, uh, Hecarim has that, Samir has that. So it looks to me like they're just going to play a more very simple press Archon. Uh, and depending on what they have in, you know, the bank for their middle lane top lane, I would assume this is probably going to be, you know, very standard. Uh, again, a SEO or a Lissandra or some sort in the mid lane. And then we look at, I don't know, some Renekton kind of champion in the top eight where it's just big bulky has AOE. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see once again, another opportunity to go for the Renekton here as Cassante gets blinded and um, knowing Zadora's was champion pool, I don't think this is a flex pick. I think this is hard going into the hands of Marcus and, you know, great, you you touched on the Sivir and Hecarim, uh, Rakan being able to run into the enemy team. So what can you expect with the rest of the draft that Slim Odds will go for? 
I'm a really big fan of the theory of if they want to engage, let's pick champs that are really good at counter engaging. So I'd love to see something like either Talia, uh, Estia could even work to that, or, or you could pick like for the jungle, you could pick something like a Maokai or more of a stand your ground kind of jungler, right? Uh, so I would like to see him go into that direction myself, as we oh. see them go into quite the opposite direction actually with the Jarvan. Yeah, Jarvan gets picked and a pretty decent pick into Sivir. I don't know how it works into the jungle matchup. Uh, but yeah, Sivir, no mobility to get out of the Cataclysm. But as of right now, the personally think the Jarvan is a little bit, I mean, just my opinion, it looks a little bit out of place for some reason. Yeah. I mean, again, Thresh is kind of an... Ooh. Gangplank is very interesting. I yeah. love the Gangplank. Very fun, very solid champion to pick. I mean, yeah, well, again, yeah, it's a 5v5 yeah, team yeah. fight come. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, yeah. I actually really like what Slim Mods have done. They've gone for something completely different. And looking at it, it's like Rakan Hecarim lands their spells, Pacific buffs the team up and does the DPS, followed up with a barrel and a massive shockwave and Interstellar are in for a world of hurt. But you've blinded Oriana into a player like Zadorzo with only banning the Aurelia. So there's a lot of counter picks. Ooh. And talking about counter picks, this is not a matchup that Oriana, Oriana is too happy to go into. Definitely not. That's something also that like that, but against a drone as well, where you're a champion with no mobility, and I, I, I noticed now as well, Gangplank, very same situation. Sivir, very same situation. They don't have any dashes, so they're very reliant on this flash. So this Jaren really just gets to decide if, oh, no one has flash, I'm just going to ulti this person, and they're more unlikely always dead. So very interesting draft here. Uh, I love to see some of these champions. I love to see Simos going in a general direction this time. All the champions kind of want to do the same thing, so I love to see that. But Interstellar, really strong 4 5 here. Yeah, really great 4 5. And more importantly, I don't know if Interstellar had the read on this, but you lock in the Jarvan and kind of feel like Slim Mods, maybe they just don't play the champions that are good into a Jarvan. So, um, yeah, as you said, the likes of Talia, it's like Talia is good. But it's not good in the hands of someone who doesn't know how that champion works, right? So you, you pick that Jarvan with confidence that the enemy team won't lock that in. And they don't. They go for the Oriana instead, kind of leaving yourself open up to ganks. And uh, a similar story to the series yesterday where Oriana was picked late into the draft. And it was up against champions that just completely counter the champion. And Oriana works really well with the team composition of Slim Odds. But it's going to be super reliant to get up the laning phase without a massive deficit. Yeah, I think that's really the name of the game here, where, sure, they do have some uh, pushing power, they do have some decent lanings. I know that, this, for example, this Gangplank is not a matchup, this is a matchup I played into Ichi, uh, where I kind of stomped him, So, I, but it's not <laughs> that good for Kisante. Uh, I love Ichi. Um, but, uh, they, like, you know, there is still a lot of value in like, the, these like individual lanes, except maybe the Orana set, which I know is very favorable for the set, but I think they can easily get out of this lane, because they do have a lot of pushing power, especially with Severe Gangplank. Yeah, they do. I think getting out the lane, it's it's not like completely doomed, of course. Like the Zed, uh, high skill cap champion, it, it definitely does rely on skill to be able to punish this Oriana. But yeah, uh, I, I can't help but feel though, if, if Slim Mods get out of the, the early game unscathed, then Interstellar just don't have enough uh, late game tools to, to deal with this composition. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is where we're going to look at the opposite coin, where last game, Wilcock had oh. to really. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of uh, Soraka running by my window there. Um, <laughs> but it, as <laughs> last game, I said Interstellar, this Wukong, they kind of they might have to look for some flanks here to really get this five v five team fight going. If they had a strong, weak early game, they didn't end up having that, of course. But I think this is a point where you could say the opposite side, where now they kind of have to do the same thing, but with the set where he kind of has to look for some picks because Oriana in the back, Gangplank in the back, uh, Sivir in the back with you know very little mobility easily gets comboed by the set uh, without him maybe actually having to commit that much so yeah uh definitely so actually zed, zed are pretty decent into a lot of these champions but um can find a tricky situation up against rakan so slim odds they have prioritized this rakan pick heavily and uh i think like looking at it usually when it comes to b1s enemy team will try and punish that as much as possible with counter picks but by the looks of it, outside of the Thresh, the Rakania can actually do quite a lot. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know how good this matchup actually is like between the Thresh and Rakan, because I could assume that the Flay is really good into the W, as it, I would assume it cancels, so 
there's a mind game there or like maybe a ping tech check where you see can he actually react to this or not and then based on that you might have a good lane or a bad lane yeah of course i mean i think yeah the flay you can react to it's a yeah as you said uh ping check but uh i think for colin you should pop the alt i think i don't think you can alt flash as fast as you used to be able to but you can uh you know flash w for example like um yeah aim the w behind the thresh so that all the spells coming towards you gets kind of dodged so um yeah and uh a real, real big shame that itchy missed your comment uh on uh you stomping him in lane <laughs> uh, uh i'm playing the fifth tier um i don't know what you're talking about uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah um so um this is a arena matchup huh <laughs> <laughs> nah but um jokes aside i think this name is like the name of the game here is how well Jaren really gets through this early game and how well Slimots survives this early game, right? Where they definitely outscale and like especially just as the five v five, right? They their synergy is, you know, unparalleled Hecker and Mariana combo, follow up from Rakan, severe gangplank. There's just a lot of like things that just AoE, press R, run them down comp. So how they play around that is quite interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see and uh more importantly, um I think we haven't touched on one really important aspect. When it has in the SLE, whenever there is a one trick that I, I mean, I wouldn't know anything about this, but whenever there is a one trick, uh, <laughs> so um, sorry, whenever, on. There, whenever there is a one trick and that player gets his one trick, it is disaster for the enemy team. Uh, and guys, his name is literally Zedorzo. He's on the Zed. Uh, and do you think in this game we could see another classic case of an SLE one trick getting his key champion? Yeah, I mean, we've seen in the past, right, with Arnfeld on the Shivana. We've seen with like, sometimes at least when JL gets his Pantheon. Uh, I mean, we see recently more with the Jomi on his Seraphine, right? Like, yeah, there's yeah. just, <laughs> you know, some champions where you just, you know, you just, you don't have to give it to him. It's fine if you just toss a little respect ban on there. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, I excited to see what he can do because again, like we saw it last game, right? But I really maybe a high APM mechanical champion set very similar. His combo may be a little bit more basic, but there's a lot of your room for, you know, to a good set to a great set, right? And I would love to see where he is on the scale. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, Zed, a champion that has actually been picked in the SLE many times before, we've seen the likes of D Wowza, X Ties, Addy pilot this champion to great success and uh we'll see if Zadorzo can add himself to that list of established mid laners in the in the scene so um going into this game have you got a favorite to win this one i mean i doubted them last time uh the interstellar boys uh previously i had them picked as you know the favorite of the series but with the draft i was like you know what i respect the confidence of Slimots, but this time even though I do believe Simos draft might be a little bit better, I think the you know the momentum from Interstellar going into the second game is gonna be more than plenty to win them this one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you here, but I think it will be a much closer fight this time around. Slim odds. They've they've gone with a draft that minimizes chances of losing, uh, and you know, in doing so, uh kind of takes away and kind of resets the mentality from the first game. I think a lot of the times in series when you lose a game like you did in the first one, it you know, you can go one or two ways. You can either just be like, ah, happens, we tried, go next. Or you can crumble and uh, you know, I think looking at the draft, I think Slim Mods are definitely moving on from that first game. Interstellar going with something similar, except obviously the difference is with the Z. And uh it do, do you think the Z pick, as good as it is in the hands of uh Zadorzo, do you think it, it kind of affects the lethality of the uh, team composition that they have? Mm. No, not, not really. I, I just believe it's come down to like, you know, individual skill and like how well they can perform as a team to some extent. But yeah, these, I mean, especially on Zara, these champions are, at least in my opinion, very individual, individualistic, like of what you can do. Yeah, definitely. And I uh, actually, one thing I noticed, Ginny going for the phase rush on Oriana, really important to get a defensive summoner spell here. So I like that adaptation. Um, as yeah, I think the error, the, the phase rush here over the uh summon area probably says I'm gonna play a bit back and a bit safe in this lane, yeah, definitely. And excited to see if he's just gonna kind of say, Oh, well, this is a bad matchup for me, I'm just gonna see the for early game. Because, in my opinion, Arana with the range range, he should have a strong early game, and we kind of saw the same thing last game, but he didn't do it. So, you know, interesting to see if this is just a, 
I'm not that comfortable in this matchup, so I don't know how to play it, or if it's just a, I don't want to risk anything early. Yeah, don't want to risk anything early. And uh, I, I actually spoke to Zadorzo uh, because, the, you know, his Z has been left open quite a few times now. I spoke to him about as to why he hasn't been picking it uh, as much as I expected. And he mentioned that he finds it frustrating because a mage can be picked. They will just buy Zonia's second item and uh, suddenly the Z is just a lot weaker than, than what he usually is. But uh yeah i mean we'll see he's gone for the z this time i'm assuming due to the strength of the matchup um and yeah uh, is, is there anything we can expect in the early game here mm, i mean i think maybe a three camp from jarvin here into the mid lane the hecarim clear is oh i just oh there's a little bit of itch for, itch for me because i hate this uh hecarim because he has space rush and i do not believe this oh. is a good room for him at all he's yeah. one of the best conquer users in the game and I hate when you don't have it, especially in the... Maybe in this draft, it's a little bit more acceptable. As you see, level 2, maybe? Yeah, coming up. Two. King Valher has walked up trying to look for a hook, and uh, I see this a lot from King Valher. They force the level 2 and get pressure down. Doesn't quite land the death sentence, but, you know, great laning yeah. aspect from them. Mm. Surprised to see Hecarim actually looking for a potential hopper here or a gang or something of the sorts, but... With the prior being gone and them just having a vision try, but she's just gonna use a lot of time here for not a lot of value. And now he's gonna be late clear or so. With the point in DC, I'm assuming as well, so this clear is gonna be really slow while the Jarvan is just outspeeding him. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, um, you mentioned the Summoner spell take here. Maybe dive into it a bit and uh, explain why Phase Rush probably is a slightly suboptimal here. I mean, in this game, I could see Phase Rush being a little bit better because they do have a lot of mobility and like uh it's easier to take in power it's just the fact that how uh, back side heavy so most of the hecarim's damage comes uh, by playing the longer fights because you get stacks in your queue so it just fit fits really well with your conqueror uh same thing with like something like trifles that needs to get stacked up there's just a lot of reason to just be more back loaded and normally with the face rush you see a lot more ad front side heavy where you just do a lot of damage on the entry and i just pref i don't think that's like the best way of playing him because you're not playing to your strength and it's a very solo QS build in my opinion. Yeah, fantastic insight from A's, but as you said, not too bad here uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, as uh, I, uh, I believe when it comes to scaling, slim odds definitely have the edge here. So um, Hyalan on this Jarvan was in great positions last game and uh, it's gonna be a lot on him to see what he can do in the early game here. You yeah, see a little bit of early game coming in through Jarvan here. Uh, Hegram ends up being on a slower pace, but he ends up actually getting more camps, so he's still in a spot where he should be satisfied with. As you see, he actually, very smart here, holds his Q for as long as possible to, he don't, obviously doesn't know the warriors there, but yeah, has to pops Ghost as well. Pops Ghost, Nijin, gonna use the Ghost, dodging out of the Q3 for Marcus, but gets pushed under the turret, so that Ghost won't amount to anything, but on the other side, Kialan gets first blood on General Decoy. Yeah. Oh, as we see a counter gang, or another gang again coming out here, but yeah, I just don't gang. think it's going to... Um, it's not going to amount to anything, but look at this big wave. Bannerex potentially could force something under the enemy turret, but once again, it is Hjallin getting the better side of the jungle matchup. Yeah, you're really uh, just abusing the fact that Jaren has a really strong early gank, and with the setup from Thresh here, there's, you know... With the spell shift from Severe, she might be a lot easier or harder to deal with with the double movement speed or right, movement uh, someone as well. So just realizing oh, we're just going for the Rakan here and just getting that free kill. Yeah, and importantly, I'm seeing some action in the top lane. Marcus, potentially, what are you doing? He just jumps forward into Banarek. Hyalin has arrived, trying to make amends for his top laner. But this Gangplank, level 5 to level 4, Oof. I can definitely imagine Hyalin will get the better of this. Banarek's trying his best to get the wave in, but nonetheless, Hyalin, once again, having a fantastic early game, picking himself up two kills. Yeah, I mean... Uh, optimal for him to die there. Uh, you could make a read that Jaren recall after going bot side, so he should be top side. But he just really wanted to get that wave in. He still got the kill, so he should be happy. Look at the items, and he has a full Warfield hammer on him. And Gangplank, I, uh, champion that just generates so much gold. Is he a gank bot lane? Yeah, gank bot lane. General decoy whiffs on the combo, drops the ignite, and King Valher and Algren will just run away safely. So a snidgen. Uh, not landing that gank successfully, but Banarex and Marcus have entered a duel, and once again, Marcus, you are not respecting Banarex! Two games in a row now, Banarex!
outplaying his opposite number. Really well played by Banax here. A uh, little hidden tech there where you can do where you get uh, auto tech off on the first barrel. Uh, you shoot it, so when you're shooting the barrel, you auto tech. Uh, because the barrel dies, you get the flame. And then by the time the second barrel dies, you get another passive procs. So really good knowledge of the GP here. And really happy to see that. Because that's a tech that not a lot of people actually do. And it really maxes out your damage. Yeah, great stuff indeed. As uh, Carlin contesting some vision in the dragon. But more importantly, Marcus. Two games in a row. When you The thing about adapting in series, you came up against this guy. He's Jax in the first game. You ended the laning phase with one and four. He's gone into this game and once again overstepped his welcome. Zero two right now. Almost doubled down in CS. And uh, yeah, Marcus not performing too well, but Banarex looking good in this uh, game two. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look great in game one, look great in game two. This guy uh, definitely a player to watch out for. And Something I don't think we expect going to the series is, you know, how oppressed this guy has been. Especially when we said before in the games really started that uh, Interstellar, a team that has, you know, really strong side laners or like mid lane, top lane. So, a three potential gank here. Or a 1v1. Yeah, another duel. But once again, Marcus losing out as Banarex is just further ahead. Mm -hmm. The flash forward and kill. Oh, I play Banarex mechanically outplaying his opponent. And Marcus sits at zero and three. Yeah, and this is going to be a scary gangplank now, because he's going to come back with a full essence rerun, and that's not going to be fun to play against at all. So, and, and we see another game where all eyes on this top lane here, where can he really carry this game, or... But this time, a lot more, you know, help from his team, right? We still have uh, AoEs, we still have uh, movement speed saver, we have a lot of things, so... Looking up for this game, especially if, considering Banner's performance. Yeah, Banner X, and, you, you know, we talk about gangplank as a champion, and... Um, he gets he actually gets more gold with the first stroke with the GP passive So this is gonna be a lot of money into his pocket and uh, one important thing I need to talk about is uh, Right now Jimmy doing a fantastic job Zed has entered level 8 which means he's two levels past his ultimate and uh, Still hasn't fallen down in this mid lane, which is gonna be super important Yeah, definitely and I mean this time in mid lane Surprisingly, a lot cl closer than it was last game, where... Yeah. I mean, he's down, what, like, very minor minions, uh... Ends up getting the Herald because he's a rotation, of course, but... I think, uh... G... What do we call it? Genie? Uh, yeah, should be very happy too. so far. Not yeah, dying to this set. Very yeah. good. Very happy indeed, and, uh... Yeah, so Dorja, I feel like on the Zed, you've got a bit of a timer in the lane phase. Zed, not the strongest champion right now in the meta, but, you know, is a specialist in the hands of some. You've got a very slim window <laughs> against the mods. you got a very yeah. slim window to pull yourself up ahead. And right now, not hitting that Ooh, window. King Valho will land a death sentence onto General Decoy. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in this game because a similar thing I need to talk about in the first game. Algren was a quiet bystander in the early game. At some point, just became the strongest unit on the map. So, uh, you yeah. know, could we see a repeat of that? Yeah, and really excited to see what this, you know, Yarlene can really do on this Jarvan. Uh, with, you know, having this early two kills, he gets the Drake, he gets the Herald, already showing a lot of presence. But when you come to this ulti, this is when it really matters, right? Pronouncing these no flashes, example on the Gangplank, right? If you get on the top of this Gangplank with the ulti, even if he is this strong with a full item already, I think you can easily get this kill down because, you know, Cassante still has a lot of base damage. It is a tank, so he has base high stats and damage. Same thing with Jarvan. So, really would like to see him punish this no flash gang tank. Yeah. Flash, as you can see on your screens, ladies and gentlemen, it is coming up soon. So, Hyalan's angle to punish that flashless gangplank is becoming short. As Ginny going to take a chunk onto Zedorzo. And smartly, this is a lot of uh, what Oriana players would do here, is to back away from the wave. You will outscale the Zed. Let's, you know, we took a bad trade. Let's back off. And uh, that one kill for Zed is a lot more valuable than the three CS that an Oriana can pick up. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, great, great there from Decoy here. Uh, show, uh, like he spotted the Jarring going into that bush here for the gank. I do believe Tiff could have probably killed her on, on his own, but yeah, just a good awareness and respecting the place. Yeah, and, uh, every time the camera pans into top lane, I feel so bad for Marcus. Uh, even under his toe, under some pressure, but yeah, we see already the damage that the gangplank is able to do. And those aren't barrels, those are just his cues. 
So you can imagine how lethal it is when a, a full barrel combo goes down. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, this is a strength that game. Gangplank at champion that very similar to like something like Draven just really accelerates fast because you get so much extra gold. And it's not unlikely to see a Gangplank that's, you know, zero, zero, zero in lane, but he just has good CS, have four items at 25 minutes. So a champion you can never count out because he still has a good side lane. He has a lot of base value in his kit and a champion that's really scary. A champion that's also really hard though. So you take the, you know, sour with the sweet. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think when it comes to watching a player like Banarex, difficulty might not be an issue as once again, Marcus keeps trying to 1v1 Banarex and I have to feel this is one of those top lane moments here like, ah, this time will be different. But nonetheless, <laughs> four kills now for Banarex and Marcus. Oh, rough performance this game. Yeah, I mean, I just look at the items, Savanix. It's just... Yes. It's just hard to watch at this point. Like, oh, the fights are close, and that's, like, the scary thing about Janking, because Gangplank only really gets damage, so you're always going to need to take the same amount of damage, and it's really just relying on, can you kill him before he kills you? But with this amount of, you know, gold... I mean, I would love to see the gold curve, actually, here before we go into this fight, but, yeah, I mean, almost twice his gold, and... Oh, my God. With a global ulti as well to help his team here, they might just, uh, you know, favor the chances in the 4v4. Yeah, Shockwave gets used onto Zedorzo, so that's going to bring him down to low HP. Stoosh is going to finish him off. General Decoy gets the kill credit. Snidgen using the ultimate there to halter the push forward from Charlon. Look at the barrel from Banarex as he arrives on the scene. And right now, last game, Interstellar dominated the game, but this time around, Slim, odds will be ahead. Yeah. Interstellar there, just trying to drop down the Herald, forces the Prior here. Gets surprised by the one-man Orianna ulti, but the follow-up is just great from General Decoy, and the snipe out at the end from Stoosha, and it's just a, well, well played for them. Like, there's no two, two ways about it. Yeah, and, uh, oh, and actually, there's a fight on two Genius, King Valhar and Hyalin. They understand the dragon is being the focus here. Genie on the wave is a reason to punish. Uh, died with flash, eh, a bit sus, but nonetheless, they get a kill back, and I want to ask you a question as a coach of one of the teams in the league. First game around, Interstellar, pick champions like, like the Zed, right? Like the Jarvan, where it's important to do things in the early game, and it seems like it doesn't work. Last game, Slim mods go for things that need to do things in the early game, it doesn't work. Is there an SLE meta where it's just about picking champions that can scale into the late game? I mean, so I think it's something we've been a little bit of a victim of in our Gucci uh, Yin team. Uh, so it's something we're kind of trying to figure out how we want to do that. Uh, but yeah, definitely something, you know, I call it the snake pick uh, favor, right? Where you say we just press R on our account champs and we kind of just win the game off that. We hope, uh, <laughs> you know, our teammates make some, or our opponents make some mistakes. But yeah, it's a, it's a fine line to walk and you have to have a clean early mid game transitioning for these early games to come to work and, you know, when you're solo laner or something, it gets killed a few times solo, it's not that bad. It becomes a lot harder all of a sudden. Yeah, much harder. And as you can see, the Zed already behind. And uh, he does have the Ravenous Hydra completed, so will help and uh, give him some support within the side lane split pushing there. Right now, Zed uh, not too far ahead on the Orianna, probably a, a few minions ahead. And uh, uh, on a champion like him, you definitely want to be further ahead, in, especially in this matchup. But, um, Okay, Interstellar, is there a way that they can get back into this game? Yeah, I definitely think so. And again, we talked about this earlier. We actually just mentioned this, right? It's a press R comp or like a team fight comp on the same sides. So you can you can win these games on the side. Uh, you can win these games by the flanks. You can just, you know, there's a lot of chaos you can create, especially with this set Jarvan, even Cassante to some extent, right? Like, there's just a lot of mobility and playing around how you move on the map is probably going to be either key to success here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, one thing as well is, um, whilst Shialan has tried his best to make early plays happen, has 100% kill participation on his opposite side, Snidgen has been farming up, and look at the CS lead, he's already starting to build. Um, this Hecarim, once that power spike comes in, will become so, so powerful, and if you're Algren, definitely a scary thing to come up against. Oh! Yeah, I do believe, uh, however, like, the thing is that he actually, sure, he's uh, decent CS, right? But when you compare it to everyone else, he, he's just barely on his item, right? Everyone else is on the exact same pace as him. So it really just yeah. depends on if he's going to be able to have enough damage to kill this Kai'Sa with 
Let's see if gang bot lane. Yeah, Ew, Shulti. Bot lane. Ginny lands a three man shockwave and almost takes down to himself. Kyalin and Zadorzo on the run. General decoy wasn't there in time. So great play from Intercell. And once again, it's Kyalin at the heart of it. Snidgen and Banarex trying to make some pressure onto Marcus. And it's just going to be the wave pushed in. But. Once again, as I said, Kjallan pulling the strings, making sure he gets something back from his team. So a kill and a turret goes in the hands of Interstellar. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, they end up also trading turrets here. I do believe Stimmel's ended up getting the first one uh, in the top lane. So a little bit more gold there, but really nice try from Guinea at the bot lane here. Unfortunately, it didn't quite make it, but, well, I good try nonetheless. Yeah, good try nonetheless. And, uh... Definitely have to keep your eyes on Hyalan because, you know, despite, I would say, two and a half losing lanes, you yourself, you're 3-0 on the drama. It's not looking too bad from your perspective. And uh, he definitely has been a player that I've been impressed with and uh, could definitely bring this game back for his team. Yeah, definitely. I mean, solid performance both games so far. And, I mean, I hope he keeps all up because now we're going into more of a late game or mid game in action. Ooh, SD. Potential fight, maybe? Yeah, potential fight in the nope. jungle. And once again, Hyalan secures himself the Scuttle Crab against his opposite number. And right now, okay, we look at the strengths of both teams. You have a 5 and 1 Gangplank versus a 3 and 0 Jarvan. Uh, who do you favor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Jarvan might have some troubles where he ulties the Gangplank and then he gets, you know, one shot. Uh, yeah. But then, if Gangplank doesn't have flash in that situation, He's just going to get hit down by this set with the Shadow. He's going to hit by the Kaiser. So it's not an easy game to play for the Gangplank at all. Even, you know, because you're so reliant on your Flash to escape situations. And you are still the strongest member of your team by far. So if your team can't pull their weight, it's very easy for Interstellar to just kill the Gangplank. Or maybe not very easy, but it's, you know, a lot easier uh, killing Gangplank and then finishing off the quote-unquote weaker teammates. Yeah, much easier. But no! Oh. Okay, well, we talk about uh, how easy it could potentially be to kill him, but also I think Vanarek, you know, you did mention, if he gets a barrel off, and we see already there, Algren already forced to his knees with one singular barrel. Um, yeah, Vanarek's really, really strong. As yeah. a dragon gets a kill. Some of this also, you mentioned earlier, right, but the falling all the way this, uh, you know, set also on two items already with uh, Ravenous. This is probably going to be close to like 300 AD. So even if this Gangplank is, uh, you know, really strong, I see a fight in mid lane. Yeah, there's a fight in mid lane. And once again, Shaolin is at the heart of it. General Decoy playing a decoy, trying to get his AD carry out. But Stoosh is going to fall to the death sentence on the side. Banarax gets a kill onto Zadorzo. Snidgen is going to try to do his best. But Shaolin, again... Keeping his 100% killed participation. Lands a flag and drag onto Snidgen. Snidgen using the ultimate to run away. But Hyalin gets kills for his team, more importantly. And Interstellar will push down this mid lane. Yeah. Uh, we saw the fight here going really in the favor of Interstellar. Uh, while that's happening, Banner still gets a 1v1 on what I assume could be a very close fight. I do believe it was uh, in the bot lane. But him coming out on top is really good for him as we see the, you know, the... A lot of cloaks built here with the Navari is really strong for the gangplank and yeah. he's only going to be a bigger menace. Yeah, Herc lands onto Ginny, but I'm not sure if that's the target you want to hurt. Look at Snidgen landing the combo to Mad Shockwave and follow with the barrel. Banarex gets himself the eighth kill of the game. Snidgen is going to chase down Marcus. You've had a rough time, but an even rougher time is in your hands using the all out to bring Snidgen over the wall. But this Cassante is just too weak. Snidgen actually being brought to low HP gets the support of the Oriana and brought to low health. So Marcus will survive for now, but with two units down, the Baron will be focused on... I don't think they can do this because Snidgen is 1 HP. But yes, Slim odds once again. You can see the strength of Banarax in these fights. Yeah, uh, I mean, just... Even not even hit a barrel, just walking up and queuing someone with this, you know, amount of gold, you're just gonna do so much damage. And the barrel hits is just almost guaranteed if they're not under the turret already, so... I mean, really happy to see a Gangplank, because something I don't think we've seen a lot of like a strong gangplank performance maybe since someone like Kat Katanenen in season three uh which i believe he was uh you know one of his mainstay champions back then but champion very hard to play very hard to perform but really putting a great performance so far yeah great performance indeed and uh yeah i mean talking about great performances 
on the other side. Hialan having a fantastic game, but definitely crying out for a bit more from his solo laners, uh, which, you know, we said that is the strength of this interstellar squad. Uh, Marcus has been missing this series. Uh, actually, both solo laners were quite quiet in the first game, so... Yeah, you can see that Hialan uh, is trying his best, but Interstellar Solo Lane is definitely getting the lower end of the stick here. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I mean, how much we flamed him earlier for the Nidalee pick, uh, I think I'm going to have to come back to this a little bit. Doing this, you know, t buying this tier at 20 minutes is, uh, you know, oh one in chess we would call a blunder, in my opinion. So, going back to the Safari, but as we look for more, maybe here, but... Yes, Nijin has pressed the E button, so King Valher is getting run down. This is just gonna be a dead thresh, as Banarex goes legendary. Nine kills on the Gangplank, and Marcus's falters in the lane phase, coming to haunt the rest of his team. Yeah, a bit of a reverse cast occurs there, where I try to put some flame on a player, and then he just <laughs> gets a pick, but... Uh, regardless, uh, this build is, in my opinion, not it, and I'm gonna have to put my foot down on this. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, great pick here from him. Yeah, great pick from him, but I'm gonna have to put some attention onto the macro decision-making here from Slim Odds, as they're actually losing a tier 2 turret after getting a pick in the mid lane. Algren and Hyalan going to face up to Ginny and Stooge, but Slim Odds, you cannot be losing these turrets when this far ahead. I believe my co-caster has died. Uh, <laughs> Hello? Hello. Uh, sorry, I think my head's a little quick little bingling. Um, but yeah, we I am back here. And not a lot of stuff that happened here also. We, I guess we're just setting up vision here for the Drake. Yeah, setting up vision for the Dragon as it is spawning soon. And similar to the last game, Interstellar need to make sure that Slim Odds do not get this... Uh, as they will make sure they can test. And more importantly, as I said, dropping these T2 turrets are massive because there's things like priority that comes into uh, into question when it comes to uh, getting to the objective first. And yeah, bit of a shame from some odds to see dropping this tier 2 turret in mid lane was uh, straight after a pick, quite unnatural. I guess like um, they decided to go for a red buff instead of pushing mid lane. Ooh, and uh, great banner on landing some more barrels onto Marcus, forced to use the flash and... Uh, just like that, the Cassante has no flash. The Snijin is going to fall. Once again, Hyalan making a play on the map. And with Dragon spawning, this was essential to make sure Interstellar stay in the game. Yeah, I mean, this is the scary thing about playing this Slimoz comp is that you kind of don't have anyone to face check either. So you don't have a pure tank. It's not a like, should... thing. So. Speaking of face check, Banarex is going to be the one to do that. That's a key target. But Zedorzo missing out on the... Z combo, meaning that Banarex will get out alive, but crucially, Interstellar secure themselves the dragon. So 2-2 two and two is the scoreline for the Drakes, and Interstellar definitely will be happy with that. Yeah, and this is a bit of a falter for uh, Semats here, because their draft is a draft where you have a Gangplank, you have a uh, Orianna. You really want to be objective first, because you don't have a lot of value in face checking. So when you're sitting on the objective, putting down a barrel and then watching them go into it, it's a lot easier than just hoping you don't get face checked. Same thing with Orianna Ball, right? If you have Orianna Ball and a choke, it's so easy to defend compared to, you know, just putting the ball on Hecarim and hopes no one kills him when he's walking to the bush, right? So, yeah, just a uh, bit of a blunder here in the positioning. Yeah, positioning not too great, but they have great positioning on this Baron as it's getting absolutely shredded. Hyalan, eyes on you! And he gets the Baron still! Takes the ladder to safety! Snidgen is going to follow with the ultimate. Hyalan probably will fall down here. Look at the speed of the Sacrum, but he's all by himself. He loses the smite and rages because of it. Hyalan, you are completely outplaying your opponent. Six kills to one, secures the Baron for his team. Interstellar in this game. Yeah, I mean, great steal from uh, Interstellar here uh, with the Lantern getting out here as well. And then Hecarim doing a little bit of a rage ulti over the wall here ends up getting taken down. And he is, you know, compared to everyone else in this game, very weak, right? With not a lot of combat value other than this one Shojin. Yeah, you said, like, I will take a replay on this and uh, you can break this down as to how Kialan pulled this one off. Yeah, so they know there's no wards in here, but what they forget is that this uh, flak from Jaren still gets full vision. So that's the scary thing about playing against Jaren, because you just always have vision, so as long as he wants to, he can just take the 50-50. And then look at this damage. There's just no damage come out from, uh, you know, CG. Or Sneaky, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Sneaky, uh, as you said, you, you were really critical on his build, and uh, 
<laughs> it shows because that genuinely looks like a full tank Hecarim when he's bought to uh, he's building a full damage uh, uh, setup here and uh, yeah Hyalin. We talk about matchups. We've talked about side lanes. We've talked about solo lanes. We've talked about bot lane. But Hyalin up against Snijin, it's not even a conversation as Hyalin is putting his team on his back here. Yeah, definitely. And. With this Baron, there's going to be a lot of momentum, right? We saw them get the bot lane tier 2 immediately with it. And when you look at this map, you only see one turret from uh, mid lane and top lane coming up from step mods, and then the rest of the map is very open. You have two mid uh, you have tier 2 gone in mid lane, you have tier 2 gone in bot lane for, uh, you know, step mods, so... Oh my god, look at the and... gold! Yeah. I mean, gold is very lean in, except the top lane, who is the only reason this doesn't look like a 10k gold lead, and that's a scary thing to be in. Yeah, and no, I mean, more importantly, look at the gold coming out from Algren and Zadorzo. They haven't done too much in this game just yet, oh. but uh, you can imagine as soon as they enter a team fight. Actually, never mind, the Zadorzo damage didn't look that good. But um, I'm sure on a squishier target, it looks threatening as hell. So, um, yeah, Interstellar from the depths of hell have managed to claw themselves back into this game, and they will push down mid and bot lane turrets here. This is fantastic from them. Yeah. As I, oh, I'm going to stop myself as Snidgen finds a pick onto Algren. He is being blocked from the Lantern, so won't be able to take that. But look at the movement from Algren. Gets himself away. The shockwave is going to be whisked, but it doesn't matter. Keep your eyes on Banarex. The barrels are going to land heavy. King Valher gets a hook onto Snidgen. But more importantly, Interstellar get out of the team fight unscathed. Yeah, and that's every single ult team, uh, you know, and Simov's gone. While under on the, you know... Side of Interstellar, they still have the Cassandra ult, they still have Set and the Threshold ult, so they can probably still stay here and play off this Baron, try to get some inhibs down maybe, and you know, create some side impression. They opt out of it and just say, well, we got enough, we got the open mid, open buff, uh, we just take this recall and try to set up Drake in time. Because we said, mentioned this earlier, right? If they set up Drake and Samus has to face check, it's very hard to, you know, win a fight. I have to be honest, Aze. Not that long ago, I was looking at this game going, it's a 1 1, I guess, but, uh, how have we ended up in this position? Yeah, and it's just uh, surprising to see that they actually have the two drakes they have. I do. I thought they only had the one, but uh, actually getting you know a second drake here is really important because this denies Snemoth's you know uh, soul point and makes it very hard. Because now with two opening hips, it might be hard to contest. I see a uh, no nothing happening here. Yeah, very hard to contest. And once again. Look at Algren on the Oof. W's, landing so much damage. Snidgen already brought to half HP, having to take a camp to heal himself back up. And you can see the members of Interstellar, they are fishing for a fight. Once again, they get first position on this dragon, which means Soul Point potentially going into their hands. And slim odds, this Hecarim just isn't strong enough to walk into these choke points. Ginny... And Zadorza will encounter each other. Look at the vision that Slim Odds have. It is non-existent as this dragon goes into their hands without any contest. And Slim Odds once again faltering at an essential part of this game. Yeah, and this is a very scary thing about having not necessarily a good front line, but also someone that just has good engage. Because if they just spin up on Interstellar, it doesn't really matter that you have this like AoE team fight uh, press R kind of comp because you're just not gonna be able to use it. You can hit one target at a time, as we see it potentially here. Yeah, potentially engage. Snidgen is gonna try to do his best. He lands a great ultimate at the start of the fight, but look at King Val here, playing the turns and baiting the rest of their team to focus him. There is no follow-up damage though, as the team fight does not go well, and Algren Zadorzo pushing down the base of Slim Odds, and it's now onto Interstellar members on the other side to stop the recalls. Gangplank has completed his. So Zadorzo will be in the middle of a fight. He kind of wished the combo, so Stooge will get out alive. There's a fight happening on Ooh. two fronts here. We do not have LNC production, so we can't see the other fight. But Zadorzo and Algren, they managed to get themselves a Nexus turret. Somehow, the other side of the map is going in the favor of Interstellar. Snidgen and Ginny fall, and it's going to be Interstellar pushing down this top lane. They've already got themselves a Nexus turret. Banarex, you are against the world, but Interstellar respecting the gangplank will back off for now. Slim odds, what have you done? You have thrown away the game with a 9-kill gangplank. Baron spawning Interstellar will secure this one. Yeah, and... Most of the uh, Simmons engaged here are more of like follow-up engaged, they're not primary engages. So having to be the initial engager with this Hecarim ulti 
Unlike uh, something like an Orin or a Malphite where it's very linear and it's very easy to follow up, Hecker Multi kinda hit or miss in some kind of way. And that just makes it really hard because they need to force a fight and it still just needs to run and play the side. As we saw here, they say three men's running from the fight while two men is just ending the game, quote unquote. So, yeah, I mean, really hard. And this is why we need to be on the objective first. This is why we need to get the things because the moment we start losing Drakes, they can also just start giving Drakes, just taking top and hip, and then the game suddenly becomes triple in down, and it's really hard to play. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like if you're Banarex here, you have to feel so frustrated. You're literally a nine kill gangplank, but the rest of your teammates just aren't stepping up. And you know, you were critical on his build, but I'm gonna be super critical on Snidgen. When you have like an Oriana who survived a Zed lane, you have a, a gangplank who goes nine kills up against a Cassante. You can't, you can't perform like this. You can't buy tier this late into the game. You, and he's basically, again, once again, awarding uh, a human ward as the Dorsa is actually going to go in the shutdown, goes into the hands of General Decoy, and uh, this could potentially be an overstep as Interstellar will be on the retreat. Charlotte is going to flag and drag away from this, and Snijin, yeah, once again, every time I've seen Snijin engage, it just doesn't do anything. Yeah, this is like the unfortunate truth about the Hicker missed that. He quote unquote looks like a engaged champion, but the engage is just not that good. So you're more of a follow up or like a disruptor in a way. Uh, and when you just need engage and you need to be able to lock someone down, he's just not the champion. Not that champion as Banorex will use the Gangplank Ultimate to deter oh. Algren, but look at that Kaiser W as he jumps forward, the exhaust is down! So the shutdown on the Gangplank! And that's the key member of Slim Mods taken down! And you can so imagine Interstellar, they will hit that trigger button of going forward, take down their base, take everything you can with the Gangplank dead. This will be the top lane focus now, Interstellar. They are only in the face of members that will not do diddly squat as Stoosh, Ginny, General Decoy, Snidgen, it's all on you to salvage the game. There oh, goes Charlotte. Great, that's great right. people with the Cataclysm. And that's the follow-up from the rest of his team. The Shockwave is good, but it's not enough. Snidgen is the first to fall. General Decoy gets flag and drag with the flash. Yarlan playing a fantastic game. Double kill for Marcus, who has been on the receiving end of Banarax this game. But nonetheless, Interstellar complete the series sweep. 2-0 up against Slim Odds. And that's going to be the game. Yeah. Great ulti that coming from Diana, but with this Builder Bear build, she's just not doing enough damage. And with all the Gangplank, there's just not enough fight. Just a clean fight taken here from Interstellar. Yeah, clean fight, but oh, I'm going to have to be really critical towards Slim Ons here. That first game, disaster class. Second game, your top lane is genuinely smurfing out the wazoo. But for some reason, we have to just throw it all away with silly mistakes. Yeah. As, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those games you're watching, you walk away to the kitchen, you come back and you're like, what the hell has happened? How, yeah. how, how are they losing? Yeah, and I don't want to be too critical of the, you know, uh, Snigim, uh, I'm, all, I'm bad with names, uh, the Hecarim, but, you know, you really need something if you're not getting it from other roles that just presses, you know, like a Jarvan, like a Malka, like a Sajani, where you have something that can start a fight. And we can back to this where it's just, you know, the jungle role kind of becomes the slave role, but, or the utility role, so to say, but in this kind of draft, you're, you should not, you know, you need something that's more, you know, concrete that has, you know, base value and it's very easy to do something because you just lacked engaged here. Yeah, lacked engaged indeed. And uh, one thing I want to say is uh, for, for Marcus here, I really hope he did that classic top lane thing where you just go top diff at the end of this game. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I mean, for Marcus, I actually have to say, despite that laning phase going the way it did, he only actually, I, th I think his scoreline was three and four. So being able to uh, cut the losses as much as you can and not just completely lose the game for your team, because I think th there was one game, it was Vitagen against, I uh, can't remember who. I think it was Vitagen against Silver Phoenix, where Kimmich Mental like, got killed a few times by Ant and just like just threw the game from that point on, just permanently just ran in and died. Marcus in this game did not do that. He knew that he was behind and he had to play a little bit of a spectator, but there is genuine skill in being able to cut your losses there. So great stuff from, from Marcus uh, to be able to hold out. But more importantly, and honestly, I have to give my biggest compliments to Hyalan. This was one of the best jungle performances up against an opponent I have ever seen in the SLE. This was, this was like, I have never seen, I, I don't want to use the word jungle gap, but I have to. Um, I haven't seen a jungle gap like this 
in any SLE game I have ever watched because usually jungle, they're very even. A lot of junglers in the league, they're very even in skill level, but this time around, it wasn't even close. This was two players in completely different skill levels. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, he did himself any favor with the champion pools he played. So I, I think that's definitely a factor. Uh, but if you're playing these champions, you have to perform on them because otherwise everyone else is just going to pick the, you know, dummy. Uh, I go Jaren, I go Maokai and say, well, my base value isn't just me being on the map and your base value is you getting ahead, right? So you yeah. need to make stuff happen. And especially in competitive compared to solo queue, it's a lot harder because people play their cards a little bit tighter to their chest. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, actually a, a message in chat from Valher, the support of uh, Interstellar. GG, well played all. Last game of Hyalan, he will go to boarding school. So shout out from everyone of Interstellar and the team. Thanks for the games, man. And not just a shout out from Interstellar, shout out from the entire of SLE. Best of luck in boarding school. And, you know, just as a message from you, when it comes to the statement you have made in the SLE in a short amount of time, you definitely have. And I think looking back at the games, I genuinely am of the opinion that you are the most impressive SLE jungler I've seen coming into this new split. So uh, best of luck in boarding school. Uh, you know, I mean, there are more important things in life than, than League of Legends. So do your best, out there. And I hope to see you very, very soon. But uh, yeah, yeah. As you said, AZ, uh, you know, it's a stellar, fantastic game from them. And, uh, you know, I think they are slowly becoming a top team in the SLA. Yeah, definitely a team uh, worth uh, watching in the future. And with MP5-1, there's also you know, a very, very good option of, or opportunity of them. You know, we have uh, 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 Blazing Titan assets, and it's, it's a Red Blazing Titan assets, uh, and later, later on, so I might, might usually face one of those, those teams, teams and how that ends up going. going. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, a strong team, team and a team that looks like they're able to talk about the for the show. Yeah, yeah, definitely indeed. And uh, we'll see how that guy's got to die for now. I've got the EV. This is the only game today. Right, right. I'm just going to check on that. I believe this is the only game of the day. I'm going to try to check on that. I do it as well. I believe this is the only game of the day, so we will be closing this stream out. We've got tons of big games happening this weekend, so if you want to keep updated with everything that is happening, get into the SLE Discord, enable your notifications, and find out when all the games will be happening. Of course, we've got our Twitch channel here, we have our YouTube channel, so you can keep up to date with all the action, never miss a single minute of League of Legends. And for now, I would like to thank my co-caster A's. You have been an amazing co-caster to cast with. Likewise to Pepper, you've been an amazing producer, as always, the legend of the SLE. Thank you very much all for joining these games today. Uh, do I get the name of GP King? No banner X, you have to win the game in order to do that. Blame your team, not me. Um, I'm joking, you are fantastic on the GP. But yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, stay tuned for more games and uh, bye bye.